Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Thoughtful Thursdays speaker series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library. Um, hello everyone and welcome to another Thoughtful Thursday at the library. Uh, it's our good fortune to have Mark Starr with us this afternoon and he's going to be talking about Swab Summer at the United States Coast Guard Academy. But before we start, a couple of requests. Uh, please check that your cell phones are turned to vibrate. And if you... Mark. <laughs> I never get a call, though, so it's usually pretty safe. And if you are not receiving online notices of our speakers, uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the desk, and you can put your name on it if you'd like to on your way out. Okay, now many of you, and probably all of you, are familiar with Mark's work. You may have seen his photographs hanging in Lagula, or you may have watched his videos online, they were great, um, or you may have heard him speak about ceremonial stonework created by the indigenous people in um, you know, North Stonington and throughout New England, and may even have gone on a tour with him. Uh, you may have read one of his books. He's written and photographed 12 of them. Or if you've gone to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., you may have seen his work there, also because it's part of their permanent collection. Mark is a documentary photographer whose uh, work focuses on working cultures throughout the Northeast uh, that Mark's senses are rapidly disappearing. So he's photographed and interviewed and filmed commercial fishermen, boat builders, dairy farmers. So I asked him why the Coast Guard Academy it seemed like such a departure from his usual subjects. And he told me that he's always been drawn to closed or self-contained, not closed, but self-contained worlds. And the Coast Guard Academy is one of them. And when he drove by, he always wondered what goes on inside. <laughs> and um, but he said that. First and foremost, his work is about people, who they are, what they do, and what it all means to them. Uh, Mark's book, may look like a coffee table book, and by all means leave it on your coffee table, but it is so much more. Um, there are photographs, of course, there are over a hundred black and white photographs, but in the slimmed down version, which I read, there are more than 150 pages of text. So Mark really is as uh, insightful and engaging a writer as he is a photographer. And his subject, the Coast Guard Academy, its values, the care it takes for the young people entrusted to it, and all of its work is really, really interesting and important. And that was something I was reminded of in the last few days watching the coverage of Hurricane uh, Florence, looking at the Weather Channel, which reported every single time I was watching, the Coast Guard was there. And they were talking about all the search and rescue work that it did. So it's with great pleasure that we had Mark Starr. Yeah. coming. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, Swab Summer at the Coast Guard Academy. And the Swabs are the incoming fourth class cadets. That would be the freshman class should they survive the summer. And it's basically their uh, boot camp experience rather than going to Cape May, New Jersey where the uh, regular enlisted people were, get their boot camp. Uh, the cadets entering the academy will get their experience at the academy. Um, 
last seven weeks, uh, many will not make it through. Um, but they start out there in the early summer, and uh, we'll go through some of what they go through in that time period. Of course, you all know the academy is on the west side of the Fangs River, uh, just above the Gold Star Bridge. Uh, it's been there since 1932. That's when that facility was built. It's been in everything, buildings, even ships. It was always kind of a hand-me-down organization uh, and changed rapidly throughout its, its time, uh, its tasks that it was assigned. But in 1932, they started building uh, the academy there, and most of that is, is pretty much from that date. There's newer buildings, of course. Uh, this building here is Leamy Hall. That's where the swabs are going to start out on our day, their reporting in day. The big building back here is Chase, and that's the dormitory. It holds about 1,200 cadets, maybe a little bit more than that, uh, although the Coast Guard is not does not have that big a class anymore. They've been reduced in the number of officers they needed for a number of reasons. Uh, so uh, uh, military organs, oh, well, let's see. The, the Coast Guard, of course, is most people think of are uh, their rescue operations. That's what they're most famous for, and probably everybody thinks of that first. It's actually probably the thing they do the least. Uh, they have tw uh, 11 different tasks that they've been assigned. Uh, and this is the most glamorous one and the one you mostly hear about. Uh, they sort of based their, their work there on one officer who was launching a surf boat in a storm in the 1800s. And one of the crews said it was a very violent storm. The ship had wrecked and they were going out in a surf boat to try and rescue a crew. And uh, one of the, his crew said, boy, I don't know, you know, do you think we can make it back? And he said, well, the regulations say we have to go, they don't say anything about we have to come back. <laughs> and that's pretty much what the Coast Guard still does today. Um, they're out there in, in some pretty wild weather. Uh, of course, the other thing they do that probably people are aware of are the AIDS navigation. They uh, maintain all of those around the coast, the rivers, main rivers, and Great Lakes, those kinds of places, and even around the world. So those are done in what they call black holes. Uh, the black hole vessels are doing this less glamorous work. And then the white hull vessels do the, the rescue, the, the high glamour stuff. They do alien interdiction, uh, drug interdiction. They're inspecting vessels at sea, uh, all kinds of other things. Uh, they have other s smaller boats that you might see around here, now armed since 9-11. Uh, uh, they do harbor protection, uh, security for things like the presidential inauguration of all things. Uh, so they're, you know, a complete military group, uh, and of course, uh, now they're largely using helicopters for rescue work. You can cover huge distances very quickly uh, in a helicopter with a much smaller crew, which is one reason why they're needing less and less officers. There's just, everything is, uh, has been updated in the Coast Guard in terms of ships requires less manpower on them. Uh, and so the officer corps has shrunk uh, somewhat. Of course, you do need officers, and they need to be trained somewhere. This is Admiral Stowe. She was in charge of the academy when I went there, or when I was there for this particular project. She was the first woman to run a military academy in the United States. And uh, I'm not sure if she is now, but they typically serve a three-year term and then move on to the next assignment. But the officers come from somewhere in the academy is where they start building them out of swabs. Uh, dictionary definition, nautical term for a Morgana mop, a useless or contemptible person or a low-ranking sailor. If you ask the swabs during swab summer, they'll pick number two is what they think they're being treated as. Um, they're actually number three, uh, but it does seem much more like number two. Um, those are swabs. Um, they feel a lot better than the swabs do during swab summer. Uh, but these are the ones that actually show up at the academy. Um, and they don't look like much <laughs> at the moment. Uh, this is other day when they appear. Well, we're going to back up just a little bit uh, because you need somebody to train them. And cadre is a group of soldiers who train other soldiers in particular tasks. In this case, the cadre are the rising um, sophomore <laughs> class. So. The swabs will be entering at the beginning of the summer. These students here 
are finishing their sophomore year or their third class year, they are going to be in charge of the entire program of SWAT summer. I mean, they have a, uh, a full schedule that they're going to meet and goals they have to meet. But they're in charge of everything that goes on with these swabs, their care feeding and everything that happens to them, broken down into five minutes units during the day. If you see their schedules, by five minute increments. And it's, when I got there, I thought, well, why would you take somebody who knows nothing about training people? Why wouldn't you take the typical um, drill sergeants from, say, Cape May to train them? And the beauty of it is, is that this is the first time that these cadets who are being trained for leadership will actually lead. And the Coast Guard is famous for tossing you in the water and seeing what happens. Um, they are going to have to lead for the first time. They've been followers their whole time they're there. And now it's up to them to indoctrinate and run the entire boot camp for all of the incoming squads. And so they start working during what's called 100th week, just before the summer gets there. They're retrained, and they don't think they've been being trained to lead at this point, but they're, they're you know, special emphasis on how they should be running SWAP summer. It's largely up to them to discuss how they're going to be doing these things and what they're going to do with their particular companies that they, they get. So they start working. They're in the classroom. Uh, picking up classroom knowledge from instructors and officers at the academy, and then they're also out in the field because they've been there now for two years, and really their military skills in terms of drill and all that formal stuff has sort of fallen off because they're inundated with all their um, college work and, and everything else they're involved in. So the people that retrain them are the, the Smokey the Bear hat wearing Hollywood version uh, drill sergeants. Uh, these are the real deal. They're, they're the best in the Coast Guard. They train the uh, recruits in Cape May. And so people like Mr. Chase come up and reinstill in them uh, what they should be teaching the cadets and actually how to do it. Uh, Mr. Chase is a very serious fellow. He's doing one-arm push-ups while correcting uh, the, the cadre as he goes. <laughs> Uh, but so they oversee them, they get them back up to speed, even on things like crunches and you know the right way to do push-ups, sit-ups, all those kinds of things, what they can and can't do with swabs, uh, how to motivate them, which is not just yelling at them, uh, although the cadre take quite a while to, to figure that out. So they go through this intensive training program for the week with these Cape May uh, drill instructors. And uh, they get back into military mode, which is basically a, or a large part of what they're going to be teaching the SWAs. Uh, they go out to the um, uh, National Guard base in uh, Nyanic and uh, do a day out there, running through their ropes course, uh, doing training of, of all sorts. There, they do a uh, they have to do a march through the the uh, woods and they'll find victims on the way that they have to deal with, the drugs that they have to deal with, all these things like that. Uh, one girl got separated from her group somehow and was ambushed by the National Guard, who was, um, I guess they scared the dickens out of her. They, they were ambushed, they were ambushed somebody else, but she wandered along, so she got quite a surprise. Uh, and they have a, a group training um, section there where you have a problem, which is generally getting that ammunition case from one side to the other without touching ground in between, and they're given a very few tools to do it with. Uh, so teamwork is what they're building here. They should be able to work as a team to get these tasks done, and that's what they're going to be t need to be teaching uh, the uh, swabs. So they're trained up and ready for the swabs to arrive. The swabs arrive on our day, reporting in day, and they're down in Leamy, that nice big building overlooking the river, and it's all very, very nice there, having coffee and tea and, and breakfast, and the parents are there, and the siblings, and the office is all very pleasant, and it's really quite nice. And then somebody stands up and orders Alpha Company to get up, move out onto the porch. So Alpha Company gets out, walks out, and of course, I'm sure a lot of butterflies, and they go down into a bus, and the bus takes them away. Now, the Coast Guard has two jobs on our day, which is uh, separate the kids from the parents, make them think that their kids have gone somewhere else, and then create a transformation that their parents will see in the afternoon, a miraculous transformation, really, 
from what they dropped off to what they leave at the end of the day. And the kids, get, or the, I should say kids, the young men and women get on the, the bus, and they actually just go up to the hill to chase. And uh, when they get there, this is who's waiting for them, their cadre for Alpha Company. And the cadre, uh, a minute before this picture, were taken, were laughing and joking around and goofing. And as soon as they hear the bus is coming, they literally turn to statues. And they've got a stony expression on their face to, to match. So the bus pulls up, and they send out their most intimidating fellow, uh, who gets up on the bus. And uh, he <laughs> goes up on the bus and politely asked him in the voice that will carry over Typhoon to get off my bus. It's so loud and so stunning, absolutely nobody moves. <laughs> they just sit there. So he encourages them by saying, get off my bus now. And he's just booming. And that time they just start scrambling. They're all over each other, knocking each other down, trying to get off that bus as fast as they can. And it turns out no matter how fast they go, it's not going to please uh, any of the cadre they run into. And of course they get off the bus and they're just wolf-packed by Cadre, who seemed very angry about their pace. Uh, and it's funny because they start saying, move fast, you know, move, move with a purpose, and they start, of course, to run because they're somewhat terrified. And as soon as they start to run, they're told, no, running, move with a purpose. So they're supposed to move at exactly the right speed, which they don't catch. And the whole thing just sort of um, harps going back and forth, zigzags back and forth, it makes it down to the, the quad. Um, as, they make it down, they're following a piece of tape, and then there's taped off corner uh, spots to stand. And they finally get there, and of course nothing they do is right. If their hat is on, that's wrong. If they look at all, they're starting to get the idea that they should not move at all. They can't even move their eyes to the side without somebody picking up on it. Uh, what they don't know is besides that storm is the storm above them. You see the clouds darkening. This tremendous rainstorm comes in that day. Very hot, very humid day. And it starts pouring like you've never seen, just absolute buckets coming down. Um, it's so dark that you could hardly take photographs. <laughs> um, but company after company comes up and they start driving. Oh, once they get there, the, some of the cadre introduce themselves and start laying down the law as you will never respond to anything with anything but yes ma'am, no sir, uh, or no excuses. You'll never look this way, you won't even scratch, you won't bat an eye. And then they drive them uh, into the chase hall, company by company. Uh, I kind of think of that line from the, uh, the uh, Christmas, Christmas, Christmas Carol, I guess, the, the dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly. It's, it's just, they just drive them into the, the, uh, the building. And then the other uh, uh, cadres start introducing themselves. And these, these kids really are in shock. Uh, they are sweating bullets, and they do not dare move. And as soon as they do, they're, they're pounced upon. So the Coast Guard then starts the process of transforming them. They've got to get them into uniforms, measured into their, into their uniforms, trying to get them look a little more like they would like. Of course, the big thing on all reporting in days is the haircut, you know, where the, the nails are shaved. Uh, and so they all visit the barber. A little bear above them is Abji, who's uh, short for objectionable presence. He's a bear that was brought to the academy by a student in the 30s, I think it was. And they kept him there, and he would roam the halls at night, keeping people in their rooms. Uh, and they had a bear there, I think, up until the 90s, and I think Connecticut passed a law where you couldn't keep a wild animal, and so they actually sent him to a farm in upstate New York. Now, I know it sounds like, <laughs> you know, where your dogs and cats went, but it was actually a farm. Uh, that the last object went. Uh, but they get shaved. The women can wear their hair long, or they can have long hair, but it has to be up in a bun the whole time, or they can cut it short, shoulder length. Most of them actually, probably 95% of them had long hair in a bun, which I think they regretted. Uh, long hair in a one minute shower a day is not, is not easy. <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of shock uh, in these these, these uh, incoming swans. The rain did find a let up. It kept the parents neatly separated from the, the kids. They didn't hear what was going on up at Chase Hall. And then uh, the nice thing was is that they could have their swearing in ceremony outside rather than in the gym, which would be rather crowded. So they did get the swabs out to train them a little bit in military drills. 
for the ceremony that will be coming up in the early afternoon. So in mid-afternoon or so, uh, they have the swearing-in ceremony, all the parents and all the, the siblings are there. And uh, it really is quite impressive. The cadre march out with their eight companies and form up in front of all the parents. And it really does appear like a transformation has occurred, that what they saw in the morning is not what they see now in only a few hours. But then the whole thing is almost derailed. Uh, it's the swearing in the admiral is asking them to swear their allegiance to the Constitution of the United States to defend it with their lives. But the cadre have done a good job. They don't dare blink without permission. They certainly aren't going to say, I do, without permission. So the entire class does not swear in to the Coast Guard Academy. It looks like they're all just going to go home. It's like that was enough. But fortunately, the Admiral, pretty quick on her feet, says the appropriate answer is, I do. And they all do swear in. But for a second, there's that awkward pause where nobody swears in. And so they're sworn in to the United States Coast Guard Academy. The next thing is to photo get the class photograph. And uh, the problem with the Coast Guard Academy is you can be five foot four if you're a woman, and you can be six foot eight. So it makes for terrible parades. Uh, if you see the Marines, you can just line them up any way you want, and they all look the same. Coast Guard, it, it's a complete mess. So, but they have a really neat sorting process they go through, and they sort right out, and they get on the stands for their class picture. Uh, by the time this picture is taken, two swabs are on their way home. They've already failed out to the Coast Guard Academy. And the cadre use this much to their advantage. Uh, they, they let them know, two are already gone. So they haven't even made it. That puts a real, a real <laughs> fear through the rest of the, the squads. Uh, after the picture, they're given 10 minutes to visit with their family, get the last words in and the last hugs, uh, test the new haircut. And as exactly 10 minutes, it's companies back in line, and everybody forms up. Uh, their smiles are gone, and they're marched off uh, to disappear once again in the Chase Hall. And uh, probably about 40 minutes later, the complete uh, the the campus is completely deserted. All the families are gone. It's quiet except for the shouting and the answers coming out of the open windows of Chase Hall. Uh, as they begin their development into leaders of character. So the morning starts for swabs throughout the summer at 5.30 with the most brutal calisthenics I've ever seen. Uh, it hurt me just to watch it. <laughs> uh, this is a little later in the summer. The people in the background are the walking wounded who, who for some reason or another, cannot do the calisthenics or whatever activity they're, they're assigned. Uh, but the, the, the morning calisthenics are really quite quite brutal, quite long. And uh, you don't want to be thought of as not doing all you can. If you are like this uh, young lady on the left, you're called out to the hurt locker, which there are five or six cadre who are really willing to show you how to put in the effort. And you don't want to gather their attention that way. When they're done, they, they gather up. I think they go back in the dorms for a, a one minute shower. It's really, they're given everything is time you have you know, four minutes for the whole entire uh, group to get in, showered, and in uniform ready for breakfast. And they lose points and they get IT, which is incentive training, uh, which is not, <laughs> it's not fun incentive training. Uh, so everything is timed and they're measured all along through, throughout the summer to see their progress. And of course, during the summer, they're getting all kinds of training, manual of arms, uh, lots of physical training, lots of ITing for not behaving or not doing what they're supposed to do, to do quickly enough. And hopefully, learning to come together as a group. They're told from day one, the major thing is to act as a group. Uh, don't ever leave your buddies behind. If you're the first one over the uh, finish line in anything that they're supposed to do, you're more likely to get in trouble. Uh, because you didn't go back and help the last person in line. And it takes a surprising amount of time for them to catch on to that, even though they're told it on a daily basis. Uh, there are students who were used to excelling, being the football captain, the team captain for this, that, and everything else, always leading. Now they get there and they're told, you're doing it wrong. Um, the books that they're reading are um, 
that are they're, they're called running running lights, and if they're viable for the summer, these are more of the walking wounded. When you're not doing anything else, you better be studying that because you need to know that book inside and out, everything in it, because a cadre can ask you a question at any time, and you need to be able to answer it, or you're going to be doing push-ups or sit-ups or something else. Uh, but the teamwork is big. Uh, this is an example of what happens uh, as a team. Somebody came out of the dorm without their cover, their hat. And he didn't get in trouble, or she didn't get in trouble. They all got in trouble because they didn't tell that person they were, they were missing their hat. So they all got to wear their hands as hats for a few hours, which will certainly make the person who forgot it never forget their hat again. But it also, once again, is impressing that you always need to be looking out for the person to your side. Uh, they do get some breaks during the summer. It, you know, it is very intense on them. And one thing they do is they go down to the sailing center and they learn how to sail these small, small boats. But down there they can drop the military raised up um, procedure because you need to be looking around. You can't be looking always straight in front of you. It's a little dangerous. But also it gives them a break. Uh, and it's quite enjoyable for most of them. Uh, they learn how to capsize. They learn how to get to the problem by land, sea, or air. Oops, sorry about that. That's Fred Higgins. Uh, so that is a nice break, and then they go back to uh, training, of course, uh, of all kinds. Oops, sorry. Um, lunches like or meals, like anything there, are not. You don't saunter up to the dining hall and have something to eat. You march up there, and then you have plenty of time to stand in this big concrete uh, quad and answer questions. And I guess the front row there uh, got a question wrong, and so now they're paying the price. Uh, you'll see other squads that are always pulling out their book whenever they can, trying to hide the guy in the middle there. Of course, he's peeking out to see what's going on. Uh, but you want to hide behind that as much as you can and try and learn as much as you can to avoid their fate. But the swabs are uh, braced up their entire swab summer and their actual their first year, so, uh, freshman year at the academy as fourth, fourth class cadets. So in meal times, they actually have to sit square up. They can't look down at their food. They just pick up whatever's there, they bring it up, they put it in their mouth, they take a bite, they have three seconds to chew it and swallow it because somebody might ask them a question and it's rude to have food in your mouth. So it, it's a very, and also, they're being grilled at the same time. If somebody seems to look down at their food, they may be asked in top questions, but they have to yell the answer with top, top voice. So I would sit down. Uh, the dining hall is on a, the back of a big hill, so it's probably three or four stories up from where I would sit waiting for them to be finished with lunch. And it sounded like a brawl going on up there. And people walking by with their uh, children showing them the academy would stop and go, what is that? So, oh, it's just lunch, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know? But it really sounded like a full-out brawl going on. So it made it very hard for them to get a lot of nutrition. Uh, you couldn't see what you're eating. They learned things like, you're going to get peas, get mashed potatoes, because you can smash them together, and when you scoop them up, they don't fall off your fork. Uh, sometimes they had no idea what they were eating. They would just have to wait until they could taste it to see <laughs> what it was. I did say the food was very good there, and you could eat as much as you wanted if you had the time. Uh, they also have a very short time to eat. And that brings us back, back to training. Uh, one thing they do, another, or another time they get a little bit of a break, as you can see here, they get professional, or the professional trainers at the academy take them aside, away from the cadre, and have them do group think. Problems. So here they have to cross this bridge that they can't reach any of the boards, and they've tied a bunch of sneakers together to try and pull the one board closer to them. So that gives them a little bit of a break. Uh, typically, as what happens is the males approach every problem as a power. It takes more power to do something, and the women approach it as we could just use our heads and do it in a sensible way. And the women are generally, like everywhere, uh, not listened to until they can't solve it in any other way. Uh, so many things don't change uh, too easily. But those are, that does give them another break. And it's quite entertaining to see some of the ideas they come up with to
to solve some of these problems. It's like they've never heard of physics whatsoever. Uh, it's kind of scary. <laughs> Uh, and then they do they do get uh, some college I mean some classroom teaching during the summer, especially in math. There it's a STEM school, so science, technology, it, um, engineering, and math are big, and math, of course, is the basis for all of that. So in the first uh, week or so, they get a test to to make sure they get placed correctly in the math curriculum, and they brush up on their calculus. Uh, during the summer, and they even get some days, uh, sometime when they sit down with a cadre and don't have to brace up, they can talk a little more freely about how it's going for them so that it doesn't go completely off the rails. Um, the main thing that the cadre need to teach them off the, the regular drill stuff is their core values, the Coast Guard's core values, which are honor, respect, and devotion to duty. And they really take that very seriously. And an infraction in any one of those will get you instantly kicked out. Uh, these are the three tugboats, honor, respect, and duty. Uh, they're used uh, by the upperclassmen for uh, uh, boat handling. They start learning ship handling on these boats. But honor, respect, and devotion to duty are one thing they spend a lot of time in the classroom trying to hammer in what it means and how serious it is. Uh, as a matter of fact, at least three or four cadre were kicked out over honor offenses during swap summer. Um, and so the, you know, the cadre have their own problems. They have these uh, charges from very early in the morning to very, very late at night. And then once the swaps go to bed, they stay up. They have meetings that they have to plan what's going on the next day. There's a tremendous amount of pressure. Some handle it very well, some don't. Um, what happens on the first day is everybody's having a great time yelling because you can finally yell at people that you've been yelled at for two years and now you can get back. And the next day they're all hoarse. Uh, and the yelling goes on for a while, but the best of the cadre learn that yelling is not an incentive really. It works. You can terrify people for a short period, but after a while even the swabs are like, well, yelling actually doesn't hurt. They can't do anything to me. And I can just stand there and let them yell at me. And so they have to come up with new methods. Uh, some don't. Uh, almost by the end of the summer, some cadre are still yelling, uh, and some swabs still aren't performing. Uh, but in general, it, it works pretty well. They finally realize that uh, there are other incentives that use that actually work better, that get their swabs performing because they don't want to disappoint them, not because they don't want to be punished. Uh, but it's a lot of trying to keep your head above water uh, for the swabs. And uh, some get there without knowing how to swim, uh, which is a particular challenge. <laughs> and so they, they continue on, and uh, the summer does wear on them. It gets very, very tiring. You can see them wearing down, but you do see them performing better. Uh, but then, fortunately, by the end of the summer, they have one nice break, which is to get on the Eagle for a five-day trip. So that gets them away. There are cadre on the eagle, but like anything else, they don't have to brace up on the eagle. They have to be polite and answer correctly, but they don't have to be squared up. Uh, the eagle was built by Adolf Hitler and became a war prize at the end of the war. So a small group of Coast Guard went over to bring the boat back. Uh, that's a very interesting story. There's a man that lived in North Stonington that was one of the original, the last guy who went over to get it. A uh, very interesting story. Uh, but they brought it back and she became the flagship for the Coast Guard. And of course it's a perfect training platform uh, for the Coast Guard or any military really because it, it requires teamwork. You cannot get that vessel from A to B without a lot of help from your crew. And so the cadets get on there and they actually do sail it. Uh, we actually went through a big storm. Uh, sails were up. I was. I was down the deck on an upper bunk, and I spent all night trying not to get thrown out of my bunk. And this is a 300-foot vessel, and I'm underwater. And I went up the next day, the sails were down, and the cadets had done it, the swamps had done it. And uh, I assumed that the, they do have professional crew on there, but the, the, the swamps who had never set sail, they'd set the sails, had never taken in a sail, went up at night in a storm, and if you can imagine what's going on high when I was being thrown out of my bunk down low, it, it was amazing. Um, 
And then while they're on the ship, of course, it's a it's a cutter. It's it's a Coast Guard cutter, and there's tasks to do working together. Um, they cook the meals. They clean they clean dishes. They clean the ship. They uh, work in the engine room. Everybody goes through fire training like they would on any cutter. Uh, all the things, many of the things that they would do on a cutter, standing watch, um, and of course getting the ship from A to B. The captain here uh, was doing a uh, noon site with a sextant, something you never see anymore, GPS. And most of the, uh, the swabs like the experience on the Eagle, if not or anything else, just getting away from the cadre. Uh, but some are quite seasick and uh, enjoy the experience a lot less. <laughs> and of course, when they're done with that, it's back to the academy. By this time, they only have about four or five more days. And they know that their last day, which is called sea trials, is coming. They don't know exactly when. Um, but the cadre keep giving them ominous warnings about the circus coming to town and how they're really going to enjoy the circus. And so they're, they're building up the fear in them uh, as best they can in the last few days that they have. Uh, and the our, uh, sea trials is their, their really their last hurdle. It's a one-day, no-holds-barred slug fest uh, that starts at 3.30 in the morning with Batman music wafting down the halls. <laughs> Very quiet, ominous music comes in. And then all the lights and sirens and flashing lights go on in the dorms, and the cadre kick their doors in. And by the time they hit the floor, they're already doing push-ups, and it just gets worse for the rest of the day. They pack their seat bags, get down to the uh, football field, and these duffels can never touch the ground during the day. So there's a couple times where they have to put them down to do what they're doing, but uh, almost, almost not. And they begin doing everything they've done throughout the whole summer trying to see if they've absorbed the lessons they've learned. They really can't get through this day without helping each other. It is way too much. And so they go through the same obstacle courses, but they've got to get their packs over there, nothing touching the ground. Everything becomes helping your shipmate. And still there are problems. Uh, some people that haven't got it yet. Uh, some cadre that are still not, not quite motivating them correctly. There's still a lot of IT going on. Uh, but they do, they do learn to help each other, uh, and it is interesting to see that transformation uh, throughout, throughout the summer. And this day, too, uh, like the, the day they came, this enormous storm starts coming up the, the river. This is, uh, what's the island north of there? The name. There's a little island north of the uh, academy that's uh, actually a nature preserve, I think. They have to run up there and get on to uh, rubber rafts and paddle back to the academy. It's actually kind of funny. I was in the boat with the cadre. The raft, there's three rafts and they're tied together with a long rope. <laughs> the river up there is very wide. And then there's one pole in the river sticking up. And we could see it from our boat from a mile away. They were going to go one side with one boat and one side with the other. And they did. And the cop there couldn't believe it. They're just looking at it. <laughs> it was rather funny. Um, but they do make it back to the academy, and their reward is to carry the boat around the track a couple of times. Uh, but then the storm sweeps in, and it is like the storm the first day, except lightning just raining down on them. And so they end up having to call the rest of the day. They lose about an hour, which was one long forced finished march at, at the end. Um, and some swabs are happy it was called, and some are actually disappointed that they didn't get the whole, the whole treatment. But they had, they had quite a bit uh, by then. And so uh, Swap Summer ends with that lightning storm. Uh, it's secured, they say, and it's like throwing a switch. All the military bearing, everything drops instantly, and the swabs are allowed to talk freely, interact with the cadre, and the cadre turn back into humans. Uh, and it's really quite a remarkable uh, change. Um, the next morning, their calisthenics are really just to stretch them out to keep them from uh, being hurt from all the work they did the day before. 
pretty casual, relaxed day. And during that time, the rest of the core comes back from around the country and the world. Uh, the, the rest of the cadets have been spread out to ships, uh, aircraft, stations, and other uh, Coast Guard duties around the world. And they return just before the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, and there's about a thousand of them. So they return for what's called the change of command ceremony and the shoulder board ceremony. And this is to bring the new SWAT in as fourth class cadets, officially welcome them into the corps of cadets. Uh, the, bigger, the bigger part of it is really the change of command. The uh, corps is commanded by the first class uh, cadets. They each, they, uh, a number of them ran SWAT summer and where everything was going, how everything worked, and they pass that command on to a new set of firsties who will run the, the corps for the first semester. Uh, it's a really impressive ceremony, although the Coast Guard doesn't make much of it in terms of parents and the SWATs. A, f a few par parents can go to it, a few parents do show up, but the shoulder board ceremony is actually a very minor thing. It's mostly they change command, and then uh, the swabs pick their favorite cadre to pin their shoulder boards on them. And so the cadre pin their shoulder boards on their swabs, and uh, the group marches off once again to disappear into chase, and they start getting ready for their uh, fall semester at school. So the swabs have made it through uh, probably, I think it was 16 or 18 of them didn't make, make it through the summer. Uh, about 34% will drop by the time the end of the four years is up, 34% attrition rate, uh, which is better than the 50 they used to have in most academies. Uh, Congress finally got tired of training that many people and throwing them out, so they, they had to work harder at not, not losing people. Um, and so they, they finish up, they've probably been through the most difficult thing they have in their lives at that point, but really the following, the, the upcoming semester will be a whole new set of challenges uh, because they do military training during it, but they also have a very heavy academic load and then sports and uh, all these other things that they're responsible for. Uh, and just to, to give you a contrast, there's a local well-known college very near the academy and I had to go over there for some reason. And uh, on their reporting in day for the freshmen, the whole freshman class was aligned on the lawn playing duck, duck, goose. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a bit of a contrast. <laughs> what went on fairly close by. Um, so that's a very brief look at what goes on the, the uh, steering squad summer. There's a whole lot more hidden in there. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer. You did not mention, I don't believe, the number of freshmen uh, that come in at the outset, first day. First day. In this class, there was about 235, I think it was, which is small. They used to be up around 300, but because of the changes in the need for officers, they had reduced it. They, typically, a class was 300. This one was around 235, I think it was. Thank you. Yeah. Is there any difference in the physical uh, requirements for men and women? Uh, no, they have to meet throughout their entire four years there, they have to meet a specific goal. And um, one, one swab, I mean, not one swab, one first, he was thrown out, I think it was about a week before graduation because he couldn't meet however many push ups or whatever it was, he could not meet. So they have this known goal. Um, it's the same for both. And really, they can all achieve it uh, at you know different different rates. But uh, women in the Coast Guard are allowed to do every single job there is in the Coast Guard. There's no no difference. How do you um, square the the abuse from the cadre to the freshmen in the hashtag Me Too era, where no corporate or business could treat or train their staff the same way? Well, of course, it, it is a military. You're, you know, you're not, you're subject to different rules in a way. And then actually, it's, it's not abuse. <laughs> uh, incentive training. So what I didn't tell you is that everything that they do is a standard operating procedure that they dare not violate. 
Um, and what's above them are whole ranks of officers, officer overlooking them, an officer overlooking that officer, an officer overlooking that officer. And there's a very strict, so like the, what the SWABs don't know, but they do figure out, they're pretty smart, is that you can only ascend to train somebody for a very short period, I think it's five minutes during the day. And what happens is they notice that, wait a minute, every time we get a center train, a cadre is getting, is doing the same thing. They learn all they need to do is outwork the cadre, which they can do. Many of them are in very good shape. Um, and when the cadre has to quit, they call off. So it's, it's a hidden thing that the swabs don't necessarily realize. They do a lot of them figure it out. Um, so it's, it's, they're very carefully controlling exactly what can do. And every time they're center trained, it's written down in this, there's a computer log that every single thing that's done or anything that happens to any single uh, swab is recorded. That's gone over every night by an officer above the cadre. So it's really, it doesn't look like there's anybody watching, but they're watching very, very closely. Um, so there's many, many things they cannot do much as they'd like. Um, so, and it's a military organization. Um, they're not, you know, joining the Girl Scouts um, or the Boy Scouts. So, I don't, th I think it's a necessary step. And, and the whole goal is to create a cohesive unit like you would with any military organization. And part of that, and I'm not a, I didn't come from a military family, and I have a lot of suspicions about military families, not families, uh, the military. And leaving there, I, I, I was really, really impressed at what they're able to do. Um, you're breaking down that whole me and I and turning it into we and us. And that you'll see later in the operational Coast Guard, uh, as you will in any military unit, willing to, you know, never leave your buddies behind. And that's, and that's part of a training that I think is, you know, it's been going on for a long, long time, and they pretty much know what they're doing. Um, it wouldn't be for me. Um, but it's really, it's not an abuse, it's, I think some cadre do, some cadre lose it. They, they are just screaming out of anger. Uh, one thing I noticed with the, the trainers from Cape May is they could be bellowing and scare the pants off you. And then a second later they go, well, what do you think of the weather, you know? It's, there's no heat in it. It's strictly, this is how you do it. Nothing personal, and it really isn't. With cadre, it can be personal. Uh, and one interesting thing for me was the man, uh, uh, Commander Hopem, I think he was, uh, in charge of the training for uh, Swab Summer. I said, you know, I see a lot of problems with Cadre who were still screaming by the sixth or seventh week. You know, and he said, that's absolutely a problem. And he pulled out the manual that they've just written to show how they're going to address that. So there's always problems. Um, but what I found refreshing was they didn't say, there's no problem, that's how it's done. You don't know what you're talking about. They saw it as a problem, and they had come up with a solution, what they think is a solution, correcting that very problem that I was pointing out. So, yeah, it's not, uh, it's a tough place. What, would, uh, what is their curriculum for the first year? Um, it's, it is pretty much spelled out. You're going to go into, they have a very few fields that they can pick, all in the math, science, engineering uh, curriculum there. I, some of it depends mathematically where they are, what AP courses they've taken. So there is some variety in it. But they're, they do tend to get what they absolutely have to have out of the way first uh, before they're allowed to pick a major. And then there's some variety in what they can do once they get there. Uh, so it's, it is largely determined you can't, you, you can pick a course that you want to follow. And it could be in economics um, or it could be in chemistry. Um, I don't know if they have a history major. I, I don't know. I mean, they have history, but I don't know if there's a major there. I appreciate your perspective because I've hosted um, cadets at my house now for five years. Oh. Uh, and when you talk about sea trials, for example, they come over to the house. Just recently, they've come. Well, how are sea trials? And I can say that because I know something about it. Oh, it was pretty cool. They said, and that's all you hear about. It. So, what you told us tonight, I think, is a nice insight, nice basic insight into the way it is for them without us really knowing what it's like for them. 
Yeah, and something like sea travel, yeah, it is a, it's a grueling day, but it's a real feeling of accomplishment to have gotten through it, and it does produce a cohesion, and, you know, people in the Coast Guard will talk about that day for the rest of their careers, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, and Swap Summer, to have gotten through it, uh, does, does bind them in, in one way. I think there's a, there's a saying in the academies, the Coast Guard, uh, you hate your academy, but you love your service. And it's reversed in the other services, where they love their academy and they hate their service. Uh, the Coast Guard has a tremendous amount of retention of their cadets. That, I forget what it is, it's like 85%, I think, stay past the five years they owe after getting this education. Uh, so it's, it's really a remarkable place, and it produces remarkable people who need to be very flexible uh, there's only 42,000, at this time anyway, uh, Coast Guard uh, personnel, which is smaller than the police force in New York City. So they, they can't afford to be a one type person. You know, you get in the Navy and you may be this, and that's it. Coast Guard, they're all over the place, uh, especially the officers. Every three years they may be doing something completely different. Uh, and that, that early cohesion, I think, is part of it. They, they really do feel like a family. They know people everywhere on the service because it is so small. Another question. I read in the day at the beginning of Swab Summer that 40% of the income class were females, higher than other military uh, academies. Do you know why that is? I mean, do they try? I mean, I know admissions programs sort of jimmy the class. Do they try to have more? According to the admissions officers who I interviewed, they said no, that it, it sort of happens that way. Their numbers have been going up, and they have wanted to get more women in there. But unlike the other academies, they don't have a congressional mandate. They don't have to take somebody from every state or two people from every state. They can pick who's most qualified from any state. That said, they try and spread it out around the country because they don't want to draw congressional attention. Um, but women probably... It, and it's kind of funny, I think most people don't realize the Coast Guard is actually a police force more than they are anything else. The people get into it because it's seen as a humanitarian. You'll hear this all the time from the swabs coming in. You know, we like the humanitarian nature of it, saving people. That they do almost no time. No, that occupies very little of their time. Most of it is drug interdiction and alien interdiction, uh, you know, cleanup of disasters, uh, you know, oil spills, that kind of thing. A whole host of things that they do beyond that. But I think people do go into it because it's seen as not, you know, a military, you know, they'd rather be saving. But they do act as a military force. You know, they were in Afghanistan, they were in Iraq. Uh, and, um, so it, it's, um, they are all around the world doing those things. Uh, but I think that's probably it. And also the Coast Guard, although women can do all jobs in the military. Now, the Coast Guard allowed women to do things much earlier uh, than any of the other services. So you could go in knowing you could fly a helicopter. There was no restrictions on women. So I think that probably also helped uh, draw them in. When you conceived of this book and started to write it, who was your intended audience? Good question. <laughs> I think I really just sort of do things that I'm interested in. I kind of wanted to know. So. <laughs> No, I worry about that later. Um, I th what the attended audience really has turned into, though, I think, are the mothers of cadets. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because I was sending out books myself, and I was all of them went to a woman somewhere. I don't know the age, of course. Um, but there's a big. It's funny on the our day there. You never go to a college and see parents exchanging emails and contacts and everything. There, it was hyperactivity because. Did Swab A, something happened to him? Because you're not going to hear anything unless they write to you. There's no communications. All the electronics are gone. Um, but I think, in a way, the, what I was hoping was that people going in, or interested in going into the academy, would read it. Because learning what it is you're supposed to do, what they're looking for, is a big... I, I don't know why they don't tell them more ahead. Teenagers often don't listen. Um, but I think they benefit in terms of retention. Uh, you know, like in the first summer, most of the losses 
uh, in Swab Summer from kids who went in because their parents wanted them to, or they're trying to please their parents. Um, that's generally what happens in the first summer. There was one medical thing where some kid got through colorblind, which shouldn't have happened. Uh, but. Yep. So I just have to point out that Melissa's son has just completed Swap Summer. Oh, no good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's got a copy of your book. <laughs> oh, congratulations. <laughs> so did you buy it? I was <laughs> going to follow up with me when he was trying to decide whether to go or not. I was up at the, at the exchange at the academy and there was one copy of the book left and it was all, you know, the binding was, all was broken. And so I asked if they had another and they said, no, we're completely sold out. <laughs> So I bought that broken binding copy, and it was very, very helpful to him to um, see the reality of what was potentially coming. Yeah, uh, hopefully it doesn't deter them. I, you he know, did, he went. <laughs> yeah, and then I mean, I mean, with others, because I think a wide-eyed appreciation of what you're getting into is way more important when you're going into something like that. It's very, very different. Um, oh, well, congratulations on that. That's really good. I mean, I, I think it's a fantastic place. Uh, I really came out a big fan of uh, the Academy and the officers. I mean, if you read the, the interviews of the officers, they're really stellar. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what percentage um, do they take of the applicants? Do they? Do they oh yeah, um, it's been a while now. They, they get. Um, I'm trying to think. I think that year they probably get around three thousand. Um, and the problem for the Coast Guard is anybody of that caliber can go anywhere and get a free ride. So they have a real challenge trying to get them to go there. Um, and it I, is a free ride? It is, unless you drop out after two years, I think. I think the first two years, if you drop out, that's okay. If you drop out, if you decide as a senior, I'm going to say, oh, I don't really want to do this, I'm going to drop out, you pay for it. Um, because you really don't want seniors getting a full education and saying, ah, I think I'll go somewhere else. Um, now, if they're booted out, I'm, I guess I guess they would pay too if they're booted out, but I'm not, I'm not positive. But yeah, they actually, and I think they get a small stipend per month because they're active military duty when they're there. Um, but that's another reason you should never go to the academy. The, the, uh, officers there in charge of bringing students in will tell them, look, you're coming here because it's free. You're not going to last. You know, that parents, you can't do it for your parents. <laughs> right. Mm. Wow. Very impressive. Yeah. I, mean, I never knew this much about it. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing place. Well, thank you very, very oh, much. Thank you.